So we're like halfway through class, and I forgot to start recording. But uh, we talked about <laughs> command line arguments and reading from files. And now we're going to this example of cat, which is all this stuff is in the ECS30 directory. So if you want to specify command line arguments um, for your programs here in C line, you go to edit configurations, and then you say, hey, I want to print out some file. Uh, this directory has to be, or the path that you specify is relative from CMake build debug. So I'm actually running inside this directory right here. So my path, for example, to this desktop.ini is from inside CMake build debug. So I have to go up one level and then I can start printing it out. Um, you can also specify a different working directory if you want, and then your program will be run from inside that directory. And so the path you can enter would be relative from that one. If I go ahead and I run this, and it gets built, and then it goes blah, 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 and it prints stuff to the screen. And if you look inside desktop.ini, hey, that's what's there. Any questions on cat? Okay. Let's say we wanted to copy a file. It's not too difficult. So to copy a file, we're given the name from a source and the name from a destination. So we it's first attempt to open the source. If we fail to open the source, we complain about it and we return. We then attempt to open the destination for writing. If we fail to open it, we complain about it. And then, um, God, stop. <laughs> just, just stop asking me. <laughs> Okay, we're just going to leave that there because apparently it wants to stay. So again, if we fail to open the file for write mode, the destination, we're going to complain about it, and then we're going to close the source. Remember to close your file when you're done with it, otherwise you're going to get memory leaks because you dynamically allocated space. And then reading shouldn't be too bad. So again, notice that same loop structure. We read first. While we haven't reached into the file, we're now going to do something with it. Um, I believe it does dynamically allocate space. Uh, it dynamically allocates space for the file struct. We'll talk about structs in a second. So we read the character while we haven't reached into the file. We attempt to write that character to the destination. And then we read in the next character. Once we're done, we close both of the files. Questions here? Yeah. It depends on the operating system, but I think most will close the, the file handles for you. Um, but again, you want to practice good programming practices and make sure that you um, explicitly release any um, resources that you're done with, so that you don't have bad habits later on when you know, like you're not doing something this simple and this small. Oh gosh, like a bit too much to get into, but like what the um, operating system is going to do, it's going to go take that name. Go figure out where that name is at on the hard disk. Go to the hard disk, read the uh, a portion of that file into memory, and then it'll have it there and it'll keep giving it to you um, from memory because it's faster to read from memory than the hard disk. And then whatever contents it doesn't have, have it'll go and pull them in as needed. So one more example for files. Um, let's say we wanted to read or write a binary file. It's a not much different. So notice here I have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I say, like, I want to write these numbers to some file. There's five of them. And then I go and I print out the files, or print out the values in the file. But remember, I'm using binary now. So in writing the ints to the file, I'm going to be putting their binary values there. So if I go and I open up this file uh, in a little bit, it's just going to look like garbage is there. Because it's in binary. It's not meant to be interpreted as text anymore. And so if you open it up with, like, a text editor, well, it's going to try to show it to you, but it's going to show up as garbage. So we open it in binary mode for writing. We couldn't open. We complain. And then I do f write my numbers. Each one's the size of an integer. Um, and then size is how big my array was. That file. Then I close the file. And for printing, uh, it's pretty much the same. 
So I open the file. Um, if I couldn't open it, I complain and I quit. And then I'm going to read out one number at a time into the address of num while I haven't reached the end of the file. And then I'm going to print it. I'm doing this because this function doesn't know how many elements are in the file. But if you did know how many elements were in the file, you could just you know read in all five at once. And then we go and we print it out and close the file. So over here is the binary numbers dot bin. So if I try to open it up as a text file, ah, it's garbage. <laughs> but those are the numbers in binary. And if I go ahead and I run this file, it prints out one, two, three, four, five, even though the contents of that file does not look like it's good because it's stored as binary, not as text. Right? If I used f printf, I would be printing them as characters. The character one followed by the character two followed by the character three. And so it would look good, like you can actually read it. Any questions for reading from files? Okay, great. That's reading from files. Hopefully it doesn't seem too complicated. It's just like reading from uh, user input, except you say, what file do I want to read from? Start with this. So now let's talk about user defined types. So there are two main user-defined types that you can create in C. There are enums and structs. We'll start with enums because they're simpler, and then we'll work up to structs, which if you've ever seen classes before, okay, shouldn't look too much different from classes, except they suck. They're like, way, they're like classes, but way worse. Um, so enums are a way to create a user-defined type that can take on a fixed set of values. So if you know you have some variable and it can only have you know, value 1, value 2, value 3, or value 4, that's when you want to use enums. The syntax for which to do this is typedef. Typedef lets you like, create an alias for a type. My type is called enum, value 1, value 2, value 3, what values it can take on. And then what do I want to name this new type? If I want an instance of this enum, I say whatever the type of that enum is, and then a variable name, just like any other variable at that point. And it's very common for enums to put underscore type at the end to know that they're actually some type. So here I could type def enum north, south, east, west as direction type. So now I have a new type of variable called direction type, and it can have one of four values, north, south, east, or west. So if I say like up equals north, I can declare a direction type left as well. Right, not initialize it, that's fine. Here's another uh, definition for another enum of red, yellow, green for our light color. And so now I can set my light color to be equal to green. Um, or again, I can declare it with no value. Any questions so far about enums? They're not as useful as the structs we'll talk about, but they can be useful for like doing things like a file might have read, write, or execute permissions. So initializing what does read permission mean, write permission mean, execute permission mean, uh, it's done that way. It's not, and you're about to see what's actually happening uh, under the scenes right now. So under the scenes, an enum is just like a fancy int. And so when you declare the enum, the values are going to be like 0 for the first one, 1 for the second one, 2 for the third one, 3. Counting up, um, you can specify different values for the enum types if you want. So if you, when you declare your enum, you can say value one equals whatever you want, value two equals whatever you want, and it will be initialized to that. So here I could say I have an enum red is five, yellow is twelve, and green is sixty-six. Um, obviously, your different enums or values have to have different numbers, so I couldn't make yellow also equal to five. That'd be really confusing. Um, and so here, if I say light color, uh, light equals red, that's basically like saying, you know, other light equals five. Doing this is equivalent um, under the hood. And so, like, if you check to see if red equaled equal five, it'd be like, true, yes, it does. 
Um, the whole point of doing enums though is to get away from using these like arbitrary magic numbers that mean things and the meaning of that thing is, isn't like uh, you know directly associated um, with the idea, right? Just you know, having to memorize that five equals red is really hard, right? It's much easier to see my light color equals red instead of my light color equals five. It's also a lot more type safe than doing the, the pound defines that we saw earlier. Any questions? So like, unfortunately, like, you know, if like you're trying to read an input, you're like, hey, user, please enter your light color, right? And they type in the word red, that's the, the string, R-E-D, right? So you'd have to like convert it internally into the, you know, um, like have some function that would internally convert the string red into the uh, light color type red. That's kind of a bummer, yeah. does not work anything like a dictionary in Python. It literally is just like an integer whose value we've given a name, nice meaningful name to. Okay. So again, enums are great, fixed set of values. Um, you're generally, when you're comparing uh, against an enum, it's always gonna be like equality or inequality. You generally don't do like greater than or less than, like is red greater than green? Is yellow less than, you know, uh, red? Is north greater than south? That's not questions you tend to ask, right? So they're going to be like uh, equality comparisons. And again, since they're internally represented as ints, you can use them in a switch statement. So I could switch on my light colors type. And if my case is red, you know, print stop. If my case is yellow, print slow down. If my case is green, you know, keep going. You can do switches on enums. Any questions about enums before we move on? Yeah. Sorry. No one told me if we did or not, so I'd have to go see. Yes. But, but like, what would like a nested declaration for an enum even mean? Like, if I have like north, like, what would you want to assign north's value to as another enum? I mean, like, like you couldn't assign it like a whole other type of values. Like, you could, if you really wanted to, and you're feeling like particularly, you know, evil. I could define something like, you know, red is equal to south, <laughs> and that works. But I have no idea why you'd want to do it, but it's legal, right? And I don't know what you mean by having like a nested enum type. I'm not sure what you would put underneath it because it can't like have another like object underneath it. It's just a value, like seven. So structs, you have to use these for your last problem. Uh, structs are ways of grouping um, many separate pieces of data together into one logical container so that you can work with that one logical container that's made up of all of these things at once. For example, you might have a person that has like an age, a weight, a sex, a name, right? It's really annoying if all of your functions need to take in this huge parameter list to work with a person. It'd be really nice if your function could just accept a person and work with the person. And then you could be able to access the components that make up that person later on. So if you want to declare a struct, it's type def struct, struct type name underscore struct. This part here is optional. This part you need if you want to be able to refer to the structs type within the struct. So it does exist. Have you guys ever seen a linked list? A linked list is a node, and each node has a value and a pointer to the next node. So a node struct would need a node pointer to be able to get to the next thing. So you'd have to refer to it by this type over here, and you'd have to say a struct, struct type name. Then you list out the types and the variable names that you want for the particular items. And then this name, you can refer to the struct to uh, the struct. You can refer to the struct's type outside of the struct using this name over here. So, as an example, we might say, "Hey, I want a person." Right? Type def struct is the keyword. This name can be whatever you want. I just normally say it's like person underscore struct. So it doesn't have to be underscore struct here. It can be whatever you want. They have an age. They have a weight. They have a name that has a hard coded 15 character limit. I should mention for your homework, if you're doing hard-coded limits on anything, you're doing it wrong. 
and you should be dynamically allocating the space as you need it. And if you're like, man, every time I try to use those pointers, I keep screwing up, that's fine, you're still learning, but spend the time now to learn how to do it. Don't just try to avoid the issue and skirt around it and still suck at it later on, right? It would really suck, you know, if like, oh man, I figured out a way to like kind of skirt doing addition when I was in kindergarten, right? You kind of need to know how to do addition to do multiplication and do the division and do the everything else you need. So again, don't skip on the pointers and learning how they work and actually using them and dynamically allocating the memory because you're going to need it in the future when things are getting even more complicated than they are right now. And so now if I want a person, I say like person Bob, person Sally, person George, I could do person Bob, call it comma Sally, comma George, would do the same thing. Um, and when you declare a struct this way, the values are uninitialized. So it's full of garbage. Don't use the garbage. Make sure you set it to something before you use it. If you want to access um, the member of a struct, you use the period to be able to access it. So you say whatever your member or whatever the instance of your struct is, and then dot the member variable. So here we have a person called Bob. So Bob's age is going to be set to 70, Bob's weight 175, and then we're going to set Bob's name to be Bob, and his sex equal to you know male. A uh, person Sally, Sally's age is five, Sally's weight equals 50, and if you want to read the value, you can just say, you know, bob.age, and it'll give you back the value now 70. Um, one thing I should mention is this should more, should more technically be called the declaration. So I'm declaring this struct, and this is what the struct looks like, right? And so it's just the blueprints for how to build an instance of this class. And now when I say something like person bob, I'm actually making an instance of this class. So it's making space for an age, a weight, 15 characters for the name, and a character for the sex. So like your declarations for the struct should go in the header file, right? All declarations go into the header file, and so this really should say like the declaration of the struct. Because you know anybody that's going to want to call your functions is probably going to that, that accept that, that struct as an argument, probably need to know what that struct looks like. So it would be in the header file, probably be at the very top of it too. Yeah. So whenever I create an instance of a person, it makes space for all of these things. So every time I say like person, it's going to make space for two integers, the age and the weight, 15 characters for the name, and then another character for the sex. Always. The space is always going to be there, um, even if you don't initialize it or use it. Any other questions? Okay. So sometimes you might have a pointer to a struct. Completely normal, because you can have pointers to all kinds of things. Um, you declare a pointer to a thing just like you would anything else, plus asterisk after it. You want to dereference the struct. You dereference the pointer to the struct just like normal with a star. Um, if you want to access the member of the uh, struct, um, it turns out that the period actually has higher precedence than the star. So you actually have to do the dereferencing first and then access the member. Doing it the other way around will cause errors. Uh, one nice thing about C line is C line is pretty good about auto correcting these things for you. So if you have like a pointer to a struct, it'll and you do like a period, it'll automatically correct it to the arrow. And the arrow is shorthand for doing the above, the dereference followed by the member access. So you know, if I have my person uh, Bob over here, I can have a pointer to Bob. Bob's age equals 70. I could do you know star p dot weight equals 175. Or I could do p arrow weight, which is the much more common version of doing it, equals 175 to change Bob's weight to 175. I could stir copy Bob into Bob's name or change the sex to be male. Yeah? The question is, when would you use a pointer to the struct? What do you guys think? When would you, use a, when would you have a struct pointer? So like it, one might be like if you want a list of structs, right? You can dynamically allocate space for an array of structs. The other would be you want to modify a member variable of the struct in, or modify the struct inside of a function. So you pass a pointer to it. So the same, the same um, reasons that you'd want to have a pointer to anything, more or less.
So you can do the size of a struct. You can say, what's the size of Bob? And that'll give you the amount of space that's allocated for Bob. Or you can say the size of person, and I'll tell you what's the size of a person object. So size of works on user-defined types as well. Any other questions? So you can totally have arrays of structs, not crazy. Uh, dynamically allocate space, just like we talked about. Nothing weird going on here that's not different from anything else. Deleting the array is just the same as anything that you'd want to do. Um, so the question is, would you have to free each struct before freeing the array? Um, you might need to free some of the members of the struct if you dynamically allocated space for them, right? Um, so here, right, if I said like, you know, this array was an array of integers, I would free it up just like I'm freeing up this array of um, people here because they don't have any dynamically allocated members. But if their names, for example, were dynamically allocated, I would need to go through each person and free up their name and then I can go free all the people. So functions can accept structs. It's not crazy. Uh, for example, here's a, a function that makes a person. It returns a person, so you pass in their age, their weight, their name, their sex, and it says, hey, here's the person, the temporary person called baby. I set their age, their weight, their name and their sex, whatever you said, and then I give back the instance of that person. So again, remember, we can only return one thing in C. Just like in Python, you can only return one thing. The way that you could get around only being able to return one thing in Python was you could return like a list, or you could return a tuple, which is still a single element. It just had all the things inside of it. So you can do the same thing in C in that if you wanted to be able to return multiple objects, you could return a single struct that had the elements inside that struct. Hmm? So you want to allocate space for the uh, the pointer to the struct, or do you want to allocate space for the struct? Well, again, like for so example, like if I say like integer pointer p, right, that allocates space for the pointer on the stack, right? If I want to make space now for the integer, I would say, you know, p equals malloc or calloc, the, the correct amount of space. I made space for a thousand people. Right, I mean, you just specify like, hey, I want a person pointer, or again, you could do the size of star city over here, it would work just as well like we've been doing before allocate space no differently than you would allocate space for anything else. If any of the members of the struct are dynamically allocated, you would then need to go through each one of the members and then dynamically allocate you know, their space for what they happen to be. Just like when we had our array of arrays, first we had to allocate space for the, um, the, like the integer pointers, then we had to go through each integer pointer and allocate space for the ints. Um, you can accept a person pointer. And then you can you know, modify it so you can change their age to be one more than what their age is right now. Nothing wrong with that. You can do plus equals here if you want to do you know, person arrow age plus equals one, or person arrow age plus plus. That all works as well. Um, there are some times where you guys will, will mess up with doing the, uh, the modification. You're like, hey, man, I passed in that person or that matrix. And then in, I was able to like you know modify the matrix's elements inside there and that change appeared outside but didn't i get a copy I did but you just have to know what you're doing and i'll try to show you some examples of um, making that happen uh so structs can appear with inside structs you can nest structs within structs within structs within structs it's not crazy it happens all the time things are made up of things which are made up of things which are made up of things uh for example we might have a family which has some members and we need to keep track of how many members there are so you can like add a family member. And so we could say, you know, family number members increases by one. We reallocate space for that new member, right? Size of the person. And then we insert that new member into our struct. Copy them over. 
or you might have like a struct that's going to represent a complex number. It has a real and an imaginary part. So our example that we've seen in adding complex numbers before, we just have a complex number num1, num2, we give our sum, we set the real part, we set the imaginary part, we return our whole complex number back, which has those two elements. Uh, structs can be self-referential. So for example, a person might have a spouse or a mother or a father. All those things are, their mom is a, whether you believe that or not, your mom is a person, right? <laughs> right? Your father is a person, like your spouse is a person, right? So if I wanted to be able to like represent that relationship inside of my class, well, I have to put pointers to those structs. Like a struct cannot contain an instance of itself or you end up with like an infinite loop of you contain a thing, right? It's like if a person had a person, right? Well, that person has to have a person, and that person has to have a person, and that person has to have a person. So you'd end up being infinite in terms of the amount of space you would need to represent a single person because every person has to have another person inside of them. But what you can do is you can have pointers because pointers occupy a finite amount of space, and then you can go dynamically create another person as you go along. So here I might have uh, update my person struct that I have a mother and a father. But again, remember C is top-down, or is a, is a top-down one-pass compiler. So it hasn't seen this name yet, person down here. So if I want to refer to the person struct, I have to use this name up here. And also, since the type def hasn't been completed, I have to say struct, person struct, to let C know that person structs is actually a struct pointer, or is a, is a struct type. Seems a little bit redundant, but that's what you got to do. Questions here? OK, so we might have like, you know, Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. So like Abel's mother is Eve, Abel's father is Adam, right? Just set them equal to the pointers, and you're good to move along. Um, so structs and enums and multi-file programs, which we'll eventually get to, hopefully, which probably is not going to happen until actually Friday, sadly. Um, you're going to want to put the declarations for the struct or the enum in the .h file because other people are going to need to know about these structs so that they can instantiate them. Great, that structs. Any questions? I know we're going really fast. <laughs> I, you know, sometime this quarter I want to get to the object-oriented object -oriented programming part of our object-oriented programming course. I know, right? It's surprising. That's what this class is about. Hey, hey, hey. We got three minutes. I got to use it. Um, so this is an example of a circular array. Um, what a circular array can do is it can fit a finite number of elements. And as soon as you exceed that number of elements, it'll start replacing the oldest values. So if you had like an array of like that could fit three elements, and you put in like A, then B, then C, you could fit all three. But as soon as you put in the next one, D, it would erase A. And so you have the front of your list would now be B, and then C, and then D. So this uh, file over here attempts to represent that. So in our circular array dot uh, H, we have our declaration, and we just have two functions defining them, add an element to the circular array, and then get the next element. Uh, we might have some other functions that might make sense, like um, uh, like getting their size. Uh, so here we have our values, we have our current pause, what position we're at in the array, where we want to read from it. We have the maximum size, which is how much space we've allocated. And then we have our current size, which is how many elements we have inside ourselves right now. So if I want to add an element to the array, well, my current array at values, at circular array, current size equals value, circular array size plus plus. Why is this so bad? Oh, I'm assuming you've dynamically allocated the space for this to, to begin with. So we just put in the value, and then we go to the next element. And then if we want to get the next element, well, the value that we want to return is the one at our current position. And then to get our next current position, it's the circular array plus one, a mod, the circular array, max size. This will cause you to wrap back around to the beginning if you try to go past the end. 
Because like if you mod anything by five, right? Mod is the remainder that you give a value between zero, one, two, three, four. So as soon as you go above it, it'll put you right back to zero. And then we reduce the size of our array. Questions? Yeah. Uh, could my add element possibly go out of bounds? Yes, it could. Um, this should say something like circular array, cur size is equal to circular, circle array, oh gosh. Circle array, arrow, cur size, plus one. Well, there needs to be some more code in here, which I'll fix it later. But you're right in that we would go out of bounds. We need it to wrap back. Or we need to have it complain that says, it's full. But we probably don't want that. We want it to, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so our size should inc should be like equal to like the max of the uh, current size and then the size that's there. So probably what we want to have happen here is to set our size to be equal to the, the minimum again, you of our current uh, Well, no, we probably won't actually want to use the modulus. Because if our size is less than our max size, our, our size should increase by one. If our size is equal to our max size, our, max size should, our, our current size shouldn't change, right? We have the same number of elements, right? We just probably need to move our current position as to maybe where we're at. Or like move our next insertion point. Right. Which again, then we'll have to start over at the beginning. Which or no, it depends like where you're at right now, actually, because it can get to like well, if you're positions still, if in the middle. At the, either at the first or the uh, second last element, then you can just put it there and you're done. But like sometimes the last element ends up being in the middle, depending on how you move things. All right. Press so you're missing the executable name. So it should be like add executable name of the executable. So your executable name might be like, so like the first argument to add executable should be the name of the executable you want to create. Its, oh. its name might be read lines. Okay. And that would be the name of the executable that's created. And then you list the source files, the .c and the .hs. Oh, okay. Thank you. I used every submission card. You have more for that? You used all like yeah, 30 or something? No, 20. 20? Yeah. How did you go through 20? I took, I made linear. Output. Output. A determinant. So, like, keep it, keep it or something like that. So, is your answer right right now?